Okay, so um, remember we were talking about memory descriptors. This was our uh, VM area structs. Remember that there's a whole bunch of abstractions that we implement in kernels that go way beyond the information that is stored in the page directory in the page table hierarchy. So this is the issue that we have that since we can't fit uh, sufficient information to do that in just the page directory, we have to have supplemental information stored somewhere else. And so um, VM area structs, great example, a uh, very classic example of how this problem is solved by Linux, where each one of these virtual memory areas has its own struct that describes where it starts, where it ends, and the permissions, the abstractions that are implemented for that virtual memory region. Okay? So this is necessary for faults. It is never accessed during normal memory accesses, but once we get a fault, the kernel uses this information as a fallback. And you'll see exactly how when you implement your own virtual memory system, because you'll have to have something that says where things are loaded from, where they're stored to, and any other details that are necessary for resolving faults. So um, that'll actually, that's one of the easier parts of the system to design, especially um, when we go through today's discussion and then Monday's discussion. I think it'll make it really clear. Okay, so um, there's other details as well. Frames, yeah, I mentioned that a little bit last time. Basically, when you have um, page frames, you have this question of um, what frames are available for use, and sometimes you have the question of who should use a certain frame, because there are certain issues with uh, you know, physical system uh, constraints. So I already mentioned DMA, how DMA tends to like lower addresses, and it tends to like contiguous regions, so that's an important constraint. It turns out that there's another constraint as well that we're going to talk about today. Um, swap space. Where is it? Is it a partition? Is it a file? Um, what parts of the swap area are actually available to store a virtual page? What locations are occupied by a page and so forth? So um, you have to have some information about swap as well. Um, Pintos is going to have a really simple one. It just has a, um, a swap partition, a single swap partition, and it has a bitmap that um, actually I think this is uh, the suggested implementation. You have a bitmap with a one and a zero. Uh, corresponding to in use or available and you don't have to think about bad sectors and things like that because we're pretending that those don't occur in the real world. Okay, so um, yeah, so managing this is uh, more complicated uh, by the fact that multiple processes can share pages and so again shared memory does complicate things rather significantly. We talked briefly about that with aliasing and how uh, when a write goes <clears throat> against a page frame only the page table entry used to perform the write is updated. Other page table entries referring to the same frame may in fact uh, not reflect that change. And so you have to be careful when you're dealing with shared memory. Okay, so uh, typically there is a frame table of some kind used to describe every page frame in the system. And uh, like I said, there are certain things that uh, constrain how we use different frames. Now, um, I mentioned DMA. And we all understand DMA because this is like the third time I've talked about it and I don't want to get boring. Um, and then you have another region, which is the kernel. And one of the interesting uh, design choices when you're designing a kernel is whether or not the kernel is going to be paged or not. Okay, so that's another area that you can think about. Uh, remember that you can have a uh, double fault. So you get a page fault during the page fault handler. If you wanted certain portions of the kernel to be paged, you could even have the page fault handler be paged. Probably would be a terrible idea that we could do that. Um, so in general, uh, many modern operating system kernels will allow certain parts of the kernel space to be paged and other ones to not be paged. Okay, so for example, process specific data might be pageable, but then the page fault handler would be pinned. You would want to make sure that the page fault handler was always in memory so that you could uh, resolve faults easily. Okay. So, um, and then anything left over, so you've got stuff that you really want to use for the kernel, stuff for DMA transfers and so forth, um, video memory, you may have constraints there as well, and then everything else is available for processes to use. Okay. So you're going to have entries in the frame table and they'll have these details describing a, what's the nature of the frame, and B, who might currently be using it. Okay. Um, now, if you think about it, if you have 
an entry for every frame in the system, then that's going to take up some space. So typically OS is trying to make these small. Uh, let's see, for which frames are in use. So what process or processes is using each frame? Okay. Yeah, and this is what I was talking about. Again, if you're using shared memory and you pick a frame to uh, you know, clear its contents, then you need to find the process or the processes that uh, are currently using the frame and update their page table. And um, that's kind of the, um, one of the subtleties of this system is that when process A faults and the kernel needs to swap in a page for process A, the kernel may page out process B's contents. You know, it'll pick a frame, process B is using it, and it'll page out those contents. So it needs to update process B's page table structure. And so obviously the frame is the thing that the kernel selects, so the frame needs to know what process was using it. So that's pretty crucial to make sure that this is done properly. Okay, where is the data from? So again, uh, if the frame is from a file, I mean I should say if the frame's contents are from a file, then I may need to write those back to the file. I may need to write them to swap. If it's not from a file, I always need to write it to swap. Okay, so that's another one of those questions that has to be resolved. Um, when a page is paged out. Is the page pinned? Okay. There's various strategies for dealing with certain circumstances and um, pinning is a common approach. It's not the only approach. In fact, um, for your implementation you may want to use locking instead of pinning. But uh, pinning is just a nice simple way of having a little flag that you set on a page frame saying, hey, don't do anything with this frame's contents. And obviously, if you have a kernel that's paged, then you could just mark some of the pages as pinned, and that way you can protect the pages that need to stay in memory and allow the rest of the kernel's pages to be unpinned, or I mean to be paged out. Okay, let's see. Another scenario where pinning can be really helpful, and again, like I said, you can, when you hear pinning, you can consider this, this to also be implementable with like a simple mutex. Um, remember that most mutexes have the ability to say, I'd like to try to lock this, and you get back a status saying whether it succeeded or failed. So you have options as far as how you implement pins. But um, common scenario is a process request an I.O. operation, so I'd like to read or write multiple blocks of a disk file. Like, in my experience, 4 kilobytes, 8 kilobytes, 16 kilobytes is a nice uh, buffer size to use for transferring data because um, it seems to... Uh, be the fastest performance that I've found in transferring data back and forth between disk and memory. And so obviously if you have 512 byte sectors that's going to be uh, quite a few blocks and if you have 4 kilobyte sectors or you're talking virtual pages then you're still probably going to end up with one or more pages being transferred. So the kernel may set up a DMA transfer in the background okay. uh, and that will take some time. Now you'll notice that uh, it could try to do it into specific virtual pages. Depends on the sophistication of the peripheral doing the DMA transfer. So that's uh, something here where you'll have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, the bottom line is if you have a DMA transfer in progress and it's going to specific frames, we can't reuse those frames for something else because the peripheral isn't going to know that the use of that frame was changed to some other process. So this is a great example where the kernel may just say, you know what, I want to make sure these pages or these frames contents are not reclaimed until this transfer is done. So it can pin them or in some other way record that these things are in use and should not be candidates for eviction. Okay? So that's one example where pinning can be really helpful when you have these long running operations. Now I'll mention as an aside, um, there is no VMA transfer in pin tilts. So sometimes what I'll tell you guys in lecture is what is possible and what modern OSs do, but thankfully in Pintos you don't have to think about this. Pintos, basically when you do a transfer, you're doing it into a frame and it actually uses old school uh, interactions with the disk controller that are um, basically blocking. So um, that kernel thread will block until the transfer is completed. So um, there's not really DMA in the same sense. So that makes you guys' life a little bit easier. Okay, another option is the kernel can maintain its own frames for buffering. Okay. So that is an option. And uh, the nice thing, 
is that now when I have the process um, running, if it's waiting on I.O. and I have like a heavy memory pressure or something like that, so a lot of processes are running and when I have large working sets and are consuming lots of memory, well, since the target of the DMA transfer or the I.O. operation is in the kernel and not in the process, I can actually page out the entire process. So that seems like a nice idea. The only problem is this copy. And so that, that usually is something that you try to be sensitive to unless you really just don't care about performance too much. Um, anytime you have extra copying of data, you have some time that you're wasting because you know, you've got a large chunk of data to transfer that's going to utilize the bus. So that's going to uh, impose a certain overhead. Not, not to mention you're probably going to have caches that are unhappy because they get filled with data and so forth. So um, copying is not your friend. You generally try to avoid it. Um, the other thing is that you do, you do occupy additional uh, frames. Like if you looked at overall, I suppose you could come up with ways of doing this more efficiently. But uh, you definitely require more virtual um, memory. You require more page frames in this uh, operation than are strictly required. OK. No biggie. Uh, let's see, other things, yeah, so like I was saying, if you have a paged kernel, then a lot of times the abstraction of the OS is I can pin kernel pages or I may have kernel pages that are not pinned so that they can be paged in and out. Okay. So um, another thing that you can do is use this to resolve various issues that can arise, again, when you have heavy system load. Um, it's one of those things where uh, you probably would never encounter this kind of thing in normal operation. You know, normal operation being I've got way more memory than I need and uh, my CPU sits idle sometimes because I don't have a bunch of CPU intensive processes fighting over it. I don't have giant memory intensive processes. So um, normally you see the OS behaving nicely. But the fun thing is when you start getting into these yo uh, low resource availability scenarios because then you start seeing if your OS makes really horrible decisions. Like, yeah, I'm in a bad situation, and now I'm going to make decisions that make it even worse. So those are the kinds of situations you want to try to identify. And um, it's because all the OSs that we've talked about along the way, where they seem to distinguish themselves are in these low resource utilization scenarios. It's like, wow, I did terribly in this case or in that case. So let's say we have a low priority process, L. Okay. It faults as processes do, and so the kernel starts loading something on behalf of L. That blocks L. So we can context switch away from L to do something else. Okay. So its page is loaded eventually. It re-enters the ready queue. But if we have a heavy system load situation, then we may have a lot of processes running. And so L's page is loaded. L hasn't gotten the CPU yet. And then H becomes able to run. Okay, so H is added back to the uh, ready queue. And it's high priority, so it preempts L jumps ahead of L. And then we have a situation where um, H faults and the kernel says, hey, L's page hasn't been accessed. And it's, like I say here, it's unmodified, so it's not dirty, which means if I evict it, it's really cheap. And then I can use that page frame for H. So this is bad. And this is bad simply because um, you've got a limited resource availability situation, and then you make a decision that makes things worse. Okay? So this kind of thing can definitely happen. One option is that as part of the policy, you could say, I'm going to pin new, newly loaded pages until they're used. Okay? And now you might say, well, that could be a long time. And I suppose it could, depending on process scheduling questions. But the thing is, is that that page was loaded because L faulted. So if L faulted, then it's going to want to use that page. So maybe give it at least one chance to use the page, and then you can unpin that page after L has run once. Okay, it's gotten the CPU once. So what that would mean in this situation is that um, your, and this, these are all the kinds of questions you have to think about when you design these kinds of policies. OK, if I let L run at least once, then now it's kind of preempted H a little bit. So if we have hard scheduling guarantees, then that could screw up my scheduling guarantees. So you have to think about how all these subsystems interact.
Um, the other thing that I would mention is that this is clearly an example of policy and not mechanism. Like the mechanism is not changed in this circumstance. The system would work correctly even if we page in a page and then immediately evict it without ever using it. Still correct. It's just inefficient. So, um, you know, policies are usually designed around efficiency and mechanisms have to be correct. Okay, any questions about any of this? It gives you an idea of how to think about some of this stuff. All right, next challenge is multiprocessor systems. Another thing that you don't have to deal with. In fact, even if you did, we would never be this mean to you. Okay? Symmetric multiprocessing is awesome because basically you have a bunch of CPUs. They may have their own individual caches, isolated caches with coherence mechanisms if you have a processor that isn't horrible. Uh, they may have shared caches so that we can do various... Um, efficient things with the shared caches. The one thing that you notice though in these symmetric multiprocessing systems is that every processor has sort of equal access to memory. So memory looks about the same from every processor. And we really like that. I mean this is, this is nice because it's a simple system to reason about. The problem is the bus that sits between memory and the processors because Four processors on a bus is okay. 16 processors on a bus, eh, not so great. And then you start doing like 64 processors on a bus and it's crazy talk. Okay. Um, the contention, it becomes the problem. And furthermore, most programs don't share a lot of data when they work because that's difficult to reason about. Normally people try to design programs so that when they're working with memory, even if they're running on a multiprocessor system, they each have their own little chunk of memory to work with, and then you, you know, combine results periodically. Something like that, okay? So, SMP is okay, but really it doesn't scale well. So you might see this again, dual core, quad core, no problemo, you'll see that a lot. But as you get larger, you end up with systems that are designed around a different model. Okay. So you'll have a chunk of memory with a group of processors that get to talk to that chunk of memory. And then you'll have another chunk of memory with a group of processors for that chunk of memory. So this is called non-uniform memory access. Okay. I have my own memory that I can interact. And then what if I want to talk to other systems? I mean other systems. Other areas of memory is really how you should think about it. Okay. Well, then there's an interconnect. And that interconnect allows a processor in one cluster, or one group, to interact with the memory in another group. Okay? But like I say here, um, it is transparent. So these can be mapped to different virtual address ranges. You know, I talk to this ad address range, and it's my local memory. So it's super fast. But I, put, uh, I access this other address range, and it's not local anymore. It's still transparent. And you can actually build this kind of a mechanism with the virtual memory. Uh, abstraction. So cool. I would love to do that or see a student try to do that in an 81 project. Just build a uh, NUMA kind of system. You can even do this over a network relatively easily. So, um, but this address range, when you access it, could be really slow. Okay. So that's uh, why we call it non-uniform, because accessing different address ranges behaves differently. It all concept I mean, it all behaves the same as far as storing and retrieving information but one part of it may be horribly slow compared to another part that's super fast. Okay? So when you're doing this kind of thing, if you want to have an OS that doesn't suck, then you need to make sure that the OS knows what regions are local and what regions are remote. Okay? So what is fast and what is slow. This actually is part of the uh, ACP information and part of the... Uh, EFI information that's populated at, at startup. The, um, the standards provide a means to figure out non-uniform uh, address mapping so that the OS is, is aware of those things. Okay. But this is the thing that's wild. Okay, because we still have frames, we still have pages, we have all that stuff, but now frames start having a processor affinity. Okay. And obviously that's something that the OS can control um, at least it can control where those frames are mapped in the address space. Okay. So OS assigns a page to a frame, 
it really should choose a frame that is on the same processor as the process that is going to be accessing that frame. Okay, that's the whole idea here. All right, does it make sense? I think this is so cool. It makes me super excited. Yeah, those can be in the same physical box, um, or they can be boxes connected with a uh, uh, high-speed interconnect over a network. So you can certainly build both of these uh, kinds of systems relatively easily. He says, it's a small matter of coding. That's a common line. OK, let's see. So we need uh, these frame descriptors. And like I said, we need them to be small because they are going to live in physical memory. And we don't want to lose too much memory to recording all these details. Uh, the 32-bit Linux example is the page descriptor. Okay. And again, this is something, if you have the Understanding Linux kernel book, it talks about, or you have access to it, um, it talks about page descriptors. They're only 32 bytes a piece. And so that'll describe four kilobytes. So four kilobytes divided by 32 bytes, you can see that you're under 1% of memory loss to these things. Okay. So that describes a frame, flags, reference count, and a number of other details. Okay. Now obviously that's a lot of information to describe in 32 bytes. And so you can imagine that there's a lot of clever things that are very similar to how threads are strung together in um, the Pintos threading implementation and so forth. You'll have pointers to a struct and the struct will have a pointer to the next struct and so you can chain things together in lists like what processes or what um, task structs are using a particular frame and so forth for shared memory. Okay, So there's a number of details that, uh, again, I'd, I'd refer you to the book if you want to see all of those details. Okay, So, um, yeah. Again, you can follow up on all of that. Now, um, this is where it's going to be really helpful to think about this in the context of assignment five. We're going to go over this again on Monday, but I want you to think about questions like, where is uh, frames contents, i.e., where is a virtual page's data come from initially, and where does it go when it's evicted, and where does it come back from when it's paged in a second or subsequent time? Because these things can come from various places, just to, you know, based on the information we've already covered. Okay. So you have anonymous memory, aka the anonymous file, and so this will be frames that you want to populate with zeros. So this will be things like stack frames. Um, that's an overloaded term. So let's say virtual page is used for your stack. Um, BSS is a great example. Comes from the anonymous file. So general purposes, memory heat, process stack, uninitialized program data, various kinds of shared memory, and so forth. Okay. So basically what happens is uh, the kernel will say, I need to load this page into this frame. The initial source is the anonymous file, and that frame's contents basically get filled with zeros. Okay. So that's cool. That's easy enough. Now think about what happens when it's evicted. So I have that frame, and it was originally from the anonymous file. Now I need to evict it because I need to make room for somebody else. For whatever reason, the uh, kernel decided to evict that uh, frame's contents. So I um, have to store it in a backing store. I have to store it in a swap device because there is no other storage location that's associated with this right now. It's not mapped from a file. It's not memory mapped. It's from an anonymous file, so it has to be stored into swap. Okay, everybody got that? So if it's from an anonymous file, then when you evict it, it goes to swap. That one's pretty easy. Now you may also have a memory map file that backs the contents of a page frame. Okay? And so basically on first page in, what happens is really obvious. right? It's supposed to be coming from the file, so I'm going to load that file's contents into that page frame, and now that's where the contents are from. So that's easy. That part is no biggie. In fact, the way that you'll do it in, the, uh, in Pintos and the way that most OSs do it is that the um, supplemental page table information will say, this is the file, and this is the starting offset, so you can seek to that, and then this is how much data to read. And if it's less than a full page, then the remainder of the page is filled with zeros. That tends to be the way it's specified. Okay. So that shouldn't be too hard to implement, right? It comes from this file starting at this offset, read this many bytes, 
any remaining bytes are cleared. You'll see something like that in process.c in fact. Now when you evict it, this is where things get interesting because it may go back to the originating file, but that's really only if the intention was for that file to be written to by memory accesses. Or if the original intent was that that file was just mapped in, but then it's kind of a private, you know, changes are private, then you would evict it to swap instead. And so that's a big distinction. You have to figure out how to handle those. Okay? Um, the way that most systems consider it is should changes be public, i.e. you go back to the file it came from, or should they be private, and so then they go to swap as opposed to the original file. So binary program. If I map a binary program, almost always I want the changes to be private. Okay, That's really crucial. If it's dot .text, it should be read-only anyway. But the thing is, is that there's a dot .data segment, and dot .data is where read-write initialized data is stored by the compiler. So if you have dot .data, and the program writes to that stuff, and then that page gets evicted, well, it better go to swap. It can't go back to the original file. I believe there may be tests about that um, in pencils, which is kind of cool. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, you have a third optimization you can apply um, besides those two um, options. One is if it's a read-only portion of the file, then when you evict it, you know the original file still has data there. So you could just throw out the contents of the page and, and not save them to swap. You don't need to write them to the file. You don't need to save them to swap. And then the next time the page is accessed, you just load the contents of the file again. So this, this can even be a clever little optimization if you want to um, do that. Okay. I don't think it's strictly required by the assignment. Okay, here's another one. Page containing non-constant initialized data. So this is what I was talking about with .data. Um, I need to allow changes, but they should not be public. And so basically when the page is evicted, make sure we save it to swap rather than the original file. Okay? That should be pretty obvious. Now here's the, uh, the other one. And again, this is something that you'll see with assignment 5 is that you have to implement mmap, mmunmap. Um, not the full Unixy version that's got like six arguments and can do all kinds of crazy stuff, but it'll just, you memory map a region of a file, I think it's always read-write, and so you can make changes uh, through that memory map region and it should hit the file. Okay. So in this case, page of data file um, mapped into memory, you, you intend to make changes to that portion of the file, and so when you evict, you write back to the file, not to swap. So, uh, yeah, and this is an interesting detail. You could synchronize the page back more than once uh, if you want to make sure other processes see it, or you could just wait to see if somebody else accesses that region of the file and make sure they see the appropriate information. Okay. So, um, this is one of those things, again, kernels are glorified bookkeepers. That's really about all it is. But um, since they're so heavily concurrent, that's what makes them hard. Okay. Any questions about these uh, scenarios? Hopefully not. I mean, this is uh, exactly the kind of thing you're going to have to sort out when you implement your virtual memory implementation. And I hope that you're all seeing that, okay, this seems straightforward. As long as I don't write a whole bunch of bugs that make it really difficult to debug, this should be pretty straightforward to, uh, to uh, implement. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so pages have to be saved into some kind of swap space. And the idea is that swap... Um, can be reclaimed at two points. One is if the process terminates, obviously the um, swap pages that were in use for the process can be reclaimed, so that's nice. Also, when the OS restarts, then I can just reinitialize all of my swap space. Um, I can go ahead and do that. Now basically you'll see two choices in the way that modern operating systems work. They can either have a, a dedicated partition I don't know if any of you have set up Linux recently, but you always see that. It's like, do you want a swap partition? Oh, I guess so. Um, but then you also have a lot of OSs that just use a, a special file. Okay. Uh, Windows uses a special file. Um, I don't think they've incorporated the concept of a partition along the way. Um, I'm just aware of them using a file. And 
OS X uses a swap file. Okay. The neat thing about partitions is that they're fast because you basically are throwing out all the extra bookkeeping that would be necessary for a file system. Okay. So that's nice. Um, typically, fragmentation isn't an issue because what are you swapping? Well, you're swapping fixed size chunks of things, pages. So it tends to be that you don't have internal fragmentation. But in a world where there was internal fragmentation, you wouldn't really care because you can always just reinitialize it. Okay. So this is nice. Um, the only thing is that um, partitions are difficult to resize. So if you happen to pick one that's too small, then you're kind of stuck with it until you repartition your, your uh, storage device. And that is a giant pain in the butt. Like most uh, OSs have not been designed to easily resize partitions. Um, I don't know, again, it may be that in recent times people have made more progress on that. But historically, like for decades, it's been really difficult to resize partitions. So you're kind of stuck with your choices if you use a partition. Files are much easier to resize. Another difficulty with dedicated partitions. Sectors do go bad. And it's funny, but um, you might have a device that you utilize and you don't even know that sectors have been going bad in it because the OS and the disk controller seamlessly deal with it so that you don't have to think about it. Okay? And that's kind of one of the nice things. I've mentioned this before about hard disks versus solid state drives is that solid state drives, when they fail, tend to fail completely. Hard disks, when they fail, they tend to fail slowly and incrementally, and you tend to be able to identify it. Okay. Has anybody heard of smart data? A lot of drives, like I shouldn't say a lot of drives, a lot of spinning magnetic disk drives have this special status information they can provide called smart. It stands for like system monitoring, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So um, smart will tell you if you have um, reads or writes that are failing regularly or need to be repeated to succeed. Uh, it'll tell you um, how many sectors have been remapped if you have bad sector data. So, like, drives are now self-monitoring, and, and, you know, the OS will monitor that and say, oh, okay, this, this drive is sucking. So, um, But if you have a swap partition, then all that machinery of, of dealing with bad sectors has to be duplicated. You have to figure out how to deal with that kind of swap. Um, swap files, yeah, like I was saying, uh, file system does impose an abstraction layer, and so if you are using a swap file versus a partition, then the swap file will probably be slower to access, but you see that you have all these benefits from swap files as well. So, uh, yeah, and I mentioned this. Um, Linux is interesting in that it can use both. Um, it seems that swap partitions are preferred if you look at installation processes at all. Um, but Windows and Mac OS X both have swap files. Okay, so the way that this normally works is you'll have special regions or locations that can be used for storing virtual page contents, and we call them slots, swap slots. And um, basically, we need to be able to find a slot that's available. We need to be able to load a page from a slot and, in all likelihood, release that slot for someone else to use. Okay. Now, um, in CS24 and in some of the examples in this class, we consider basically the slot, in, uh, the slot number is the same as the page number. But in reality, it's not going to work that way. Um, virtual page X will be mapped to slot Y. And so somehow the system needs to keep track of that. So Linux has a map that it uses to describe this stuff. And uh, you can imagine that this, again, is very tightly packed. So since the uh, value, the maximum value is 32768, you can imagine it's using two bytes per slot. And basically, it'll say how many processes are using the slot. Zero means it's available. And 32768 means it's a bad slot, like it has a bad sector and you shouldn't use it for storing data. Okay. Very interesting. Now, um, you'll notice this, this interesting detail. Um, I'm, we're talking again about 32-bit Linux. So 32-bit Linux has the ability 
to have up to 128 different swap regions. So that includes swap partitions, swap files, and so forth. And then there's an array of 127 entries, and each entry describes a swap region. Now, most um, implementations or most uh, installations are not going to have that many swap areas. But it's pretty wild because you can have an obscenely large amount of swap storage available using the simple method. Okay, so there's two values. You have the index of the swap area. That's that um, number between 0 and 127. And then the index of the slot within the area. And these things are actually packed into the page directory entries and the page table entries. Remember when the present bit is 0? The entire rest of the entry is available for the OS to use. And so this is how Linux uses it. We've got... 4 bytes minus 1 bit. So the bottom 7 bits, the bottom remaining 7 bits are used for the swap area index. Okay. And then the rest of the bits, so now you have 24 bits, can be used to say what index within that swap area. Okay. So you see that that's not too bad. 64 gigs of swap space per swap area. And so you can have 8 terabytes of swap. Um, using the simple mechanism. And who uses 32 bits anymore, right? We all use 64 bits, and so you end up with even more space in the page table entries when they're unused, um, because now those entries are um, 8 bytes instead of 4 bytes, and so swap can grow as well. So this is more than sufficient for dealing with um, a 32-bit address space. Okay. Let's see, yeah, so that's what's stored into the page table entry uh, when a virtual page is swapped out. And so this is how Linux looks things up. Um, again, I mentioned this last time, but um, in your Pintos implementation, you're certainly not required to do that. Like, you could use the page number from the faulting address and look it up in a hash table what should go there. You know, that's no biggie. Uh, or a swap map, so you can look up in the swap map um, where, where that thing is stored or whatever. Okay, so you, you have uh, a lot of options there. But this is how um, modern, efficient OSs do it. Okay, so a fault occurs. The fault handler goes and looks at the swap slot. Okay, and so then remember, um, we have the area index. That'll be one of the arrays, 0 to 127. And then we have the index within the swap area. We can say, is this a file? Is this a uh, partition? What is it? Then it can go and access the appropriate slot from that device, pull the data in, stuff it into the frame, and off you go. Okay. Fault resolved. Okay. Allocate an unused frame. Yes, hold on just a sec. Uh, update the process page table to refer to the frame. And then uh, load the contents from disk into the frame, and off you go. So that's, that's what I was saying. Um, in this picture, we're showing what's in the page table entry when the, when the page is not in physical memory. Um, so what would happen is Linux would come in and look at the area index, and it would treat that bottom. So remember, the bottom most bit is um, present. So it would take the bottom byte, shift it over by one bit to throw that off, and then it would use that as an index into an array of data structures. And each data structure will describe is this from... Uh, the swap partition, or is this from a specific memory map file, or so forth. So that's where that information would be. And Linux supports up to 127 individual memory map files at once. That is a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, I don't know if this limits the number of memory map files. I can't imagine it would, and so I'm hopeful that perhaps what it does instead is it maps... Um, you know, you could imagine it uh, mapping all memory map files from one device to a particular uh, index, or you could imagine it mapping all memory map files to a specific index that then does some other resolution mechanism. But those are totally wild ass guesses. <laughs> um, I'd have to I'd have to do some research to find out the the real answer to that question. Okay. But good observation. I was wondering the same thing when I was re reviewing the slides. Okay, any uh, other questions? Okay. Let's see, policy. So let's talk about um, virtual memory. There's two main things you have to think about uh, policy-wise. 
So we've talked about a lot about mechanisms so far. Um, first one is when I need to get an available frame, how do I pick a page to evict? So that's the page replacement policy, aka the eviction policy. You'll hear it term, termed that as well. And then also, how many frames should a process be allowed to occupy? Should it just be like completely demand driven? Or should I constrain processes? So that's a really interesting question, and that's something that we'll talk about. Uh, I believe we talk about it in the next lecture, so we'll talk about that. Um, that's the page allocation policy. Okay. Um, again, fortunately for Pintos, you can choose simple versions of the replacement policy, and then you'll just choose a global allocation policy. Um, again, that's a really easy solution for this problem. Okay, now um, we're going to talk briefly about uh, replacement policies. How do you actually um, determine which one is best in some way. And this gets back to some of the stuff that uh, we do in assignment 8 of CS24, um, which is being able to measure the behavior of a policy. So um, we'd like to be able to evaluate them. We can actually measure them against sequences of memory accesses. Okay? And it's really interesting because there are specific memory access traces generated <coughs> by real programs that you can get as a data set and then utilize to verify various policies. Okay? And it's kind of interesting. You can generate them randomly, but then that's not going to give you a real-world behavior metric. Okay? So basically, we take a memory access, access sequence, and then we simulate a policy against it, and we look at the fault rate. How often would it fault, given a certain number of pages? Okay? And so we would expect that if a policy is better, we should get fewer faults. Now, that's the whole idea. Um, as an aside, I don't want to spend too much time because we're going to run out of time if I do. But um, these memory traces are uh, not hard to generate because we have a lot of good emulation platforms. Think about QEMU. Think about Box, although you guys, uh, most people haven't been using Box this term. But um, there's things like, uh, what is it, Valgrind. Everybody loves Valgrind except you can't really use it in 124 because you're running an OS. So Valgrind is a processor simulator. And the way the Valgrind works is it's got a processor emulator and then it's got components you can plug in. And one of them watches memory allocations and deallocations and memory accesses. And then it compares them to see where your program is misbehaving. So you can always write a plugin for Valgrind that just says every time you see a move instruction or a push or a pop or anything like that, just log what memory address is accessed. And you can batch them up and write them out in like multiple page chunks or something like that that's super fast. And now you have a memory reference trace. You could get a memory reference trace for Postgres or, you, or for any other program uh, that you can run in user space. And there you go. You have a great memory reference trace. Okay. Um, the problem is that you get a lot of accesses, right? I mean, this is huge. Um, I actually, there's a really slow way of doing it that I use for assignment eight. Um, for the optimal policy, so it's kind of fun. But you have a sequence of memory accesses, and there's a couple of observations. One is, we really only care about pages being accessed, so that means that we can throw away the offset within the page. Okay, we're going to have a weird situation where the pages are 100 bytes in size, so we just drop the bottom two digits. Hooray for us. Okay. Um, second thing, if we have multiple accesses to the same page, typically those won't cause a fault, except in very low memory availability situations. So in those cases, we throw a adjacent access. So you see I have 14161111. Well, just condense that down to a 1. Okay. So we end up with a much shorter trace. Okay. Now we can use this for emulation. Okay. We call this a memory reference string. Let's see, so we have a policy, a reference string, and we also need to know how many frames are available. And this is the last thing I want to make sure we talk about. Number of frames increases, number of faults should decrease. That's what you would assume. Turns out that this isn't always the case. There's a special anomaly. I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. He's Spanish. Uh, Laszlo Baladi or Baladi or however, but he discovered that the, there was this weird behavior that sometimes you can increase the number of available frames and the fault rate goes up. It's really strange. 
So basically, we would imagine that a good policy would never suffer from this anomaly. Okay, let's go through this really quickly. FIFO, very simple. Uh, we just have a first in, first out queue. So a page gets loaded, it gets put into the back of the FIFO. We always evict from the front of the FIFO. And you'll notice that we don't care whether the page has been accessed. We just kick it out from the front if we need another frame. So three page frames, here's a reference string, one, two, three, four, one, two, five, one, two, three, four, five. Sequence of accesses would be, obviously, you have certain faults that are compulsory because nothing is loaded at that point. Page four is loaded, we evict page one, and then we have page one access, sadly, and so we evict page two, and so you can see that we actually are generating um, quite a few faults. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So in this case, we have nine faults. Now, the first three were unavoidable, but then the rest were just kind of bad behavior, right? So, all right, maybe you could argue the fourth one's uh, unavoidable as well. So 12 axis is nine faults. Now, if we increase our memory to four frames and we have the exact same reference string, then we have one, two, three, four. Again, those are kind of unavoidable. One, two, yay, look, we're actually avoiding faults. Five, one, two, three, four, five. So, yeah, that's no bueno, right? So this is an example of the anomaly. We added a frame, we got more faults. So weird. So um, we'll talk more about the anomaly next time. But um, I want to show you before we finish that um, there is a policy called the optimal policy, which is to always evict the page furthest in the future, access furthest in the future. This actually gives you the minimum possible number of page faults. And it's funny because people are always like, well, how can you even implement this? Well, if you know the future, you can do that. So if you have your memory reference traced, you can figure out the optimal policy. Okay? And like I say here, it does not suffer from this anomaly. Um, like I say here, you have to be able to predict the future. So that's why it's also known as the clairvoyant policy, which I like. But um, normally it's just called opt in research papers about this. Okay. So um, basically, a lot of policies try to approximate the optimal policy. We'll talk about that a lot next time. And uh, since you can compute it if you have the entire memory reference trace, you can say this policy comes within 5% of optimal or something like that. Because then you actually can compare it to something that you know is the best. Okay, I'll show you this real quick and then we'll just wrap up. So three frames, same reference string, so we know the optimal choices. So like I said, the first three we can't do anything for. Page four, we get a fault. Who should we evict? Well, we know we're accessing one and two well before we access three, so we'll evict three instead. So we have, uh, we have one, two, and four in memory. So page one, two, and then five. Who do we evict? Well, again, we look at um, one, two, and four. Which one is accessed furthest in the future? We say, well, four is accessed furthest in the future, so we'll evict four for five. And then one, two, three faults. We can't avoid it. And at this point, I don't think it really matters as long as we don't evict five and be idiots. And then four is loaded. Okay. So optimal does only seven faults, okay. which is good. We're already better than FIFO. <laughs> so we know the future. How could we not be? OK, so now we try it with four frames. And same thing, four accesses, four faults, unavoidable. One, two, uh, five. OK, this time we evict page four because it's furthest in the future. One, two, three. And again, so those are all happy. Um, we have to load four as long as we don't evict five and aren't idiots, then we're good. Okay, and then we load five, and so we see six faults. Okay. Now, obviously, this doesn't con uh, conclusively demonstrate that we don't have this anomaly, but uh, there must be a proof somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, there's a proof. Anyway, yes, question. Um, why are the first four called faults? Now? Because the idea, yeah, the reason why the first four are faults is because, it, um, remember, if we're doing pure demand paging, then those, uh, there will be no frame with those pages' contents in memory yet. 
So they're kind of compulsory. You can't avoid them. Yeah. Even in the optimal strategy, you're going to like do more than one space. Yeah. So I guess another way of thinking about it is a fault is equal to uh, page load. And so if you look at it from that definition, even if you preloaded those things, you still, yeah, you still incurred page loads. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I'm really sorry to keep you late, but I wanted to show you that video. So we'll see you next time. We'll, we'll stop here and pick up next time.